All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 16th day of January in the year of the Lord 2024, which is an election year. And I bet there's a lot of people upset this morning. Um, I, apparently, I, I, BBC, I bet, I bet the Brits are, huh, what are they going to do? What are the neocons doing? What are the, uh, the, the globalists doing right now? Trump apparently won uh, the... Uh, what do you call it? The, not, not the uh, election, the caucuses in Iowa. My wife was asking me, what's the difference between a caucus and an election? It's like, hmm, <laughs> easy question, right? No. No, I tried to explain it. Do I really know? Well, yeah, sort of. But would I bother to go to a caucus? Depends on my mood. Would I go for a caucus like based on the candidates that are running this year? Nope. Not at all. Not at all. But uh, assuming nothing happens, I lived through the 60s. Things happen. Lots of things can happen. Um, and this country is more divided than it was in the 1960s. It's probably more divided than it was before the Civil War. Because this Civil War was, you know, over a... A handful of issues, the predominant one being slavery, Nikki, wasn't the only issue, and it was not the issue for which both sides fought, by the way. For Lincoln, the issue was the Union. For the South, the issue was states' rights. That, those were the, the reason people actually fought. But yeah, slavery was the underlying thing that brought both those things to the head. And sl slavery was the, ba the big moral issue. But uh, at that time, the country was more Christian than it is now, although the North wasn't very Christian. The North and were like Unitarians and Universalists. And that's what happened to Calvinists. Within about two or three generations, they became Unitarians and Universalists. Which is pretty much what has happened with the, come to think of it, what has happened with the recent young restless and reform movement. All these young Calvinists, they all went woke, which is about the same as the Unitarian Universalist in some ways. All right, so I, uh, you know, the, the, the tensions are so high, the divide is so deep in this country, uh, and it's not a simple moral divide. It's an entire different worldview. You have, it, it is, is, is beyond belief. It's, these are the last days. We have a, a, a what, what, what do you even call, you've got Christianity, there's real Christianity, so I'm going to, but, but on the other side, what, what is that thing? What is it? It is anti-Christianity. That's the only way to define it. It is Satanism. Who do I see? I, I happened to look up. Where was it? Life site, which is a Catholic pro life website here. And that's why it says Trump. Uh, let's see here. Where's the button here? Trump declared winner of Iowa caucus. De, uh, DeSantis beats out Haley for second place. That's good. Haley's an out and out neocon. Um, you know what was I found very disturbing was all the Republicans. And all the Democrats almost, when they uh, have come out completely supporting Israel in what they're doing, in, in their genocide. These people have been alerted by lawyers that they could be subject for prosecution for, uh, for genocide. See, if you are 
actively supporting genocide by funding it, by arming the people doing it, or even if you have the ability to do something about it and you don't do it, you can be tried for genocide in various degrees. United, Biden is, is partners in genocide. Apparently he's losing the youth vote. Good. Good. I'm, I'm less concerned about the youth than a lot of people because youth, we were all there once upon a time. They tend to be idealistic. They, they want a cause. They want, to, they want a good cause. That's why they went on the woke bandwagon. They didn't know any better. And there is, and, and what, when you look at what calls itself Christianity in the United States, it's not a good option. It is not. It is junk. Um, especially when you're looking for something that you can see and hear and touch, you know. The 60s, yeah, that was a lot of youth going on there. It's just they are being used now much more than they were then. Uh, like Black Lives Matter, but especially Antifa, I suspect those kind of groups have been totally, um, what do you call it, co-opted by uh, people in government. And it would be so easy to do nowadays with the Internet and social media. Who knows what's actually on the other end of the connection? You don't. You don't, especially with AI. You don't know. You get all these these bogus calls as it is, people trying to con you of this and that, and the junk in the mail, the cons in the mail, they're designed to look like a government check, all this, all this, or the outside of the envelope makes it look like it's official to get you to open the thing. And of course, you know what's really in it, but... My wife just can't. I just throw it in the trash. My wife, she can't just leave it there. <laughs> it's like, no. I look at it and say, nah, that, that's not government. It goes away. So here, it's, what's, what was I going to look at here? Oh, yeah. Um, so you've got You've got two interested. Talk about um, contrasts. You've got Pope Francis. A couple of days ago, what did he say? Oh, the world's the greatest sin, the greatest possible sin is gluttony. Is it? First of all, what is gluttony? Is it simply eating too much? No, that's not what gluttony is. Gluttony is a form of idolatry. Almost all sins come down to idolatry. Loving something more than you love God is idolatry. The love of money is idolatry. When, if you, if that is your love, if so, if it, it exceeds your love for God, it's idolatry. Uh, lot, everything can be idolatry. Uh, if it exceeds your love for God, it's idolatry. So gluttony is is uh, much more to do with people that live for food rather than just eat too much. It is people that that's that's what they're about. They all are, you know, it's, it's about, uh, it might be about gourmet food. They might eat very little, but they, you know, it. but their whole life is centered around food. Or their whole life is centered around, say, f say exercise or physical health or anything like that. It That's a form of idolatry. Your life is supposed to be centered around God, it's supposed to be in Christ. And so when, but Francis didn't mean it that way, obviously. To Francis, the, the why it's a sin is probably because you're eating too much of the planet. And, of course, every bite you take is something something some poor person can't eat. Like, that's how far removed he is from reality. should put that old man out in a field someplace with a hoe. <laughs> I wonder how long he'd last. Not very long. It's like, well, give him a hoe and see if he knows what end does what. Oh, probably once upon a time. But it's it's uh, just complete ignorance. The Pope is biblically ignorant. He's spiritually ignorant. He's a pantheist. He's a, an earth worshiper. He believes that creation is God. 
He worships creation. That's Laudato Si. He worships creation rather than the creator. What's that called? Well, what happens to people that do that? The wrath of God is upon them. Idolaters, the wrath of God is upon them. It's like like gluttony in the sense of worshiping food. That's what you live for. That's your that's your great love. God's wrath is on you because you're worshiping the creature, the creation, rather than the creator. Love of money, same thing. Love of government, same thing. Love of power, same thing. Some of these things are created by man rather than God, too. <sighs> All of it. If it's not, if God is not the top. You're an idolater, and the wrath of God is on you for that. doesn't matter what it is. You're an idolater. God is angry with you, and then he gives you over to strange affections. Look at the Catholic hierarchy. What do you think's going on there? Why is, is such a huge proportion of them given over to strange affections? Because they're idolaters. And they love something other than God, they, and they have a false gospel, which is what we're going to talk about here. So you, you also have Vigano on the other side here. Now, Vigano is interesting. He says this comment here. This is an archbishop. He said that that is the mortal enemy of Francis. He's the most outspoken man against Francis. He says Francis is an antichrist. He's a usurper. In other words, right now he's saying the, the throne of Peter is empty. There's a, there's a usurper, a, a false pope, sitting on it. <laughs> uh, Vigano says, a dev uh, Davos, Davos elite motivated by Satan's hatred, not just wealth and money and power. Wealth and power. Of course. <laughs> that should be obvious. Um, everybody in the world, everybody that's not born again, they are children of disobedience. And who rules over the children of disobedience? Satan. He's their children. Davos is his children of Satan. They're not Christians. If you're not, if you're not the child of God, you're the child of Satan. He is the original sinner, and sinners are his children. Uh, the, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience is the way Paul puts it, the Apostle Paul. And what spirit is that? Satan. Satan and his demons. And he works in the world and everything else. Why do you think things are the way they are? It's because, well, Calvinists, that's, that they say it's God's will. Calvinists are terrible. They say it's God's will. They're pantheists, really. Uh, because everything is God's will, therefore everything is God. I mean, because God's will, is, well, there's a technical reason why that, those are the same statement. But I don't want to get into that. It's, so that's what we got going on out there. It's crazy. Uh, so, so then they have this. Okay, Francis, the, the one that they says here, I, I like to think of, uh, of an empty hell. Of course he does, because that's where he's going. It won't be empty because he'll be there. But here, look at this. This is, it can't be an ad for gold. It has to be for stuff. Peace of mind for your future, where trust turns to gold. St. Joseph Partners. I got to look at that. Protect your family, your fel, uh, your family and wealth like St. Joseph. Hmm. So what are they selling? Gold. And they're misusing scripture. Look at this. This is a Catholic pro-life website. Conservative. Trust. Th th talk about. Using the scripture for your own personal gain. Welcome to your journey securing your family's future and financial stability. In these uncertain times, being re uh, responsible stewards of our family and our money is more critical than ever. What did Jesus say about money? If you trust in your money, you're already gone. Just as St. Joseph one of history's oldest recorded gold custodians safeguarded the Holy Family with gold. Talk about abusing Scripture to sell a product 
isn't this like the people in the temple that Jesus cast out? <clears throat> the, the, the sellers of the traders and coins and sellers of, of pigeons and doves and uh, a animals for sacrifice. We believe that gold and silver can shield in today, can be your shield in today's unpredictable world. This is a utterly anti-Christian ad on a Christian website. Abusing. This is, say, talk about satanic. Abusing Joseph. I suppose that's because the, the, uh, the wise men brought offerings, including silver and gold. So what? They probably needed those to, to make the journey down to Egypt. They probably had relatives down there too, by the way. There was a large, uh, uh, a large Jewish uh, colony, so to speak, or population in Egypt at that time. So they very well might have had family there too, which is, might be why they went there. Of course, they couldn't stay where they were. Uh, Herod. So they go on here, and they misuse the Bible. The Bible itself, Haggai 2.8, God declares the silver is mine, the gold is mine. So? Does God say to trust in silver and gold? No, he says those that do that are fools. In the New Testament scriptures, uh, New Testament scriptures uh, uh, advises us to buy gold refined in fire for wealth creation. Really? Really? I, I, I have to. I have to go. I have to. Because these people are evil. So, oh, what do I find here? Okay, I so said gold and fire. That's what I search for. So, so what? I, what did I find here? James chapter five. So, what does the New Testament actually say about gold and silver? Your gold and silver are is cankered, um, corroded, rusted. Now, real gold doesn't rust, but it corrupted. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were, as if it were fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. This is James's answer to this scam, this gold scam, that's advertising on a on life site news, and they're letting it advertise. This is not a little. <laughs> St. Joseph Partners. These are Catholic cons ripping you off. Wicked people. They probably think they're doing a good thing, too. But the, the New Testament Scripture advises us to buy gold refined in fire. Okay. James says your gold is cankered. And it's going to be a witness against you in the judgment. You've heaped up gold to protect yourself in the last days. In the days of God's judgment, you're heaping up gold and silver as protection. It's a witness against you. You'll be damned. Doing the, you're an idolater. Uh, okay. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7, that the genuous, genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes... Yeah, even gold will perish because it's of this creation. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to uh, to praise, honor, and um, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith, your faith, your faith, not your gold. Your gold will condemn you. It is your faith that counts. That's it. The only certain thing is Christ. The only thing that the, the only certain protection we have is faith in him. Now, the actual quote they mentioned, of course, is Revelation 3.18. This is the Lord Jesus speaking here. Revelation 3.18 speaking to, is it the church that I think it is? Hmm. 
the Church of Laodicea. Yes, the Church of Laodicea. What does he say? We have to get some context here. Start verse 15. The Lord Jesus writing to this church, having Paul or uh, John write to this church. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Why didn't they put that in that ad? Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy. He's talking about these very people here that are doing this ad, that the security is in wealth and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Why? Because they're trusting in junk like silver and gold rather than in Christ himself. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. What's he talking about there? Is he talking about literal gold? Are these people so... that They would twist the words of Jesus to sell what Jesus condemns. The accumulation of gold for protection is condemned by God as idolatry. That you may become rich. What? Rich indeed. What kind of gold is this? The kind of gold that is more precious than gold. It's your faith. You need faith in Christ that you may be rich. Gold doesn't make you rich in Christ. No way. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness. So what does he say? He says, because they think they're rich, because they have possessions, he says, but you are actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So that's where these uh, these the Saint Joseph partners scam will get you. It will be you will become wretched, poor, blind, and naked if you trust them. Yeah, that's the gold refined by fire is who? Christ Himself, faith in Him. As Peter says, the gold that's that, uh, that is more precious than gold refined by fire. Faith. Your faith in him. That's where your security is in Christ alone. Because gold is worthless. You don't remember, do you? <laughs> Probably. That I don't personally remember. That Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, confiscated the gold. It, he made it illegal for American citizens to own gold. So he bought it at $20 an ounce and then immediately raised the price. It was, he wanted to be able to control the amount of money in circulation. So they had, and it was because it was based on gold, they had to do that. So he made it, so he took your gold and then jacked the price up, creating more currency in effect. Because paper was based on gold. Wow. What a dishonorable thing. Unreal. This is unreal. St. Joseph Partners. Founded on America. Christian values. <laughs> what? The love of money. That's a different Christian value. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, again, he... he be yeah, he likes to think of an empty hell because he knows that it won't be empty because he'll be there. Because he leads people astray from the truth. He's one of those that Paul anathematizes, false teachers, because he teaches a false gospel. He tells people now, for example, in his latest Fiducia Supplicans, that... Uh, um, same-sex couples can be blessed. Obviously, that's the church's approval. The church can't bless what God has cursed, right? So God must not have cursed it. It must, it must be. In order, to, a blessing from the church has to be a blessing from God, doesn't it? Or it has nothing to it, right? The, the kind of blessing that they talk, talk about in that document of descending, descending. So does the blessing of God come up? 
come upon people that are in, involved in the kind of sexual relation acts that are involved in a same-sex couple? Does it? Does God bless that? If you believe Francis, you're going to go to that hell that he thinks is empty, but it's not. Because you believed a lie rather than the truth. You know what the truth is. You don't like it. You like what Francis tells you. He tickles your ears, so you want, you like him. Because he doesn't tell you the truth, so you like him. I like Vigano more. He generally speaks the truth. I'd have to interrogate him, though, to find out what's behind it. But Francis? There's no reason to even question him. He's already told us what he is. He's one of those uh, Davos elite motivated by Satan's hatred. The child of the devil. No question about it. No question. How do you know? You compare him. Jesus said you know them by their fruit. He's telling people that it's blessed to engage in what God calls vile sin. Abominable sin. God will bless you if you do that. Just come, ask us. We'll give you a blessing for doing those things. Being in a relationship where that's part of your life. In fact, that's an act of idolatry, too, which is always an abomination. Why? Because you've, your love for that is greater than your love for God. It's an idol. Really, all sin is an idol. The sin of self-centeredness, the sin we're born with because God's not in us. That's idolatry. We put ourselves above God. Isn't that what it is? Isn't that what we do all the time when we sin? We put ourselves above the will of God, our will above his will. Isn't that what Adam did? He put his own will above the will of God? Wasn't that the sin? Not eating the fruit. It was putting his will above the will of God. That did it. The bite was just the consummation of that will. The finishing the act. An outward sign of the inward sin. Okay. So what do I want to talk about today? About counterfeit Christianity and real Christianity. How do you tell the difference? How do you tell the difference? Well, how do you tell the difference between a genuine bill, uh, you know, like a $100 bill, and a counterfeit. Well, first of all, you have to have a, a genuine one. You have to compare. You compare the genuine with the one in question. Do you look at the similarities? No. You look at the differences. So you have to look at the difference between the genuine and the, and the one under examination to see if it's a genuine thing. It's the same way with Christianity, the gospel. You look at the genuine. Where do we find that? In this book. In the teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles, in particular. Especially the apostles, because it's after the cross. Before the cross, Jesus teaches a lot about the law, and the gospel is somewhat hidden, although it's there, especially in John. It's like the gospel according to Jesus in John. Let's, uh, it's just not explicitly stated because of, um, let me see here, where is it, John? Because if Satan, as, as we find out later in the, in the epistles, if Satan had known what God's plan was, that by crucifying Jesus, Satan was destroying his own kingdom. Ha, ha, ha. He wouldn't have done it. So it was kept under wraps. It was kept under wraps. That's the way God works. He, he kept it under wraps. He, he had his plan. and sa He had his trap, and Satan stepped right into it. By Satan's own hand, he destroyed himself and his kingdom. We're just waiting for the kingdom to all that to be con finally done okay but it's it's already uh, it's already been accomplished at the cross we're just waiting for the manifestation of it 
So in in First uh, John chapter three, or in John chapter three, excuse me. Uh, if we go down to verse thirty six, because it's I like this one because it doesn't have subjunctives in it. John three sixteen says the same thing, but John and uh, John three fifteen, but here we said uh, in John three thirty six because it doesn't have he doesn't have the the um, um, would or uh, what does it say should I think John three sixteen says. For God so loved the world that he, uh, he, God did not send an, oh, excuse me, that's 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The should is because it's a, a hint of clause and it's, it makes it sound indefinite because subjunctives can be indefinite, but it's not in this clause. Uh, it's just an artifact of the grammar. So, but in 36, because it doesn't have that clause there, it doesn't have that. It has just that indicative. So we hear it, we see. It's not a problem in Greek. It's just a problem in English, mostly. Uh, he that believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who believes in the Son has, present tense, in, uh, uh, indicative. There's no doubt about it. E uh, eternal life. You already have eternal life. If you're believing in the Son, you have eternal life. Why? Because eternal life is in the Son. It's like you have forgiveness of all your sins because that's in the Son. Everything we have, all of salvation, all the love of God, all the good things from God are all packaged in Jesus Christ. He is the Christmas gift that keeps giving. And he is the wrapper of everything we get from God, the man, Jesus Christ. That's the outer wrapper. God is the center. So if you believe in him, if you receive him, if you receive God's Christmas gift, Herod didn't receive the Christmas gift. The, the three wise men and the shepherds did receive the Christmas gift. If you receive him, if you believe in him, you have eternal life. And Jesus in John 17 says this is eternal life, that you would know God. Knowing God, is, to, to know God is to have eternal life. Same thing. Do you know God? I do. Do I comprehend him <laughs> comprehensively? Of course not. Of course not. But I know God. He's, he's my Father. He's my Savior, my Lord, my God. I mean, I know him. I've known him for 47 years. I knew about him before that, but I didn't know him. He's the one that saved me. <laughs> And I didn't need a church for it either, or a preacher. Oh, I was a mess, but God saves messes. I was a wretched sinner. God saved wretched, wretched, saves wretched sinners. In fact, he prefers people like that. Read 1 Corinthians. Consider your calling, brethren. Not many mighty, not many rich. <laughs> yeah, so the elite, the Davos crowd, there ain't going to be many... Uh, saints coming out of that group. God just doesn't, he, he wants to put those people to shame. So he picks the people that are nothings to dishonor them. <laughs> okay. It's like Lazarus and the rich man. What's another example? You know, so, so say, say there's a guy <laughs> Say there's there's a, a a person that disabled, he lives out in the street, but he's he loves Jesus Christ. This doesn't usually happen, by the way. I've never seen that happen, but so he, he's he's by the office door of Trump Tower, and some big shot that's living up there someplace goes by him every day and maybe gives him a bad luck and say, "Why don't you get a job?" You know. Just because you don't have two legs, why, why aren't you working? <laughs> Say it's a Vietnam vet that's been screwed up and both legs blown off. And <sighs> So God comes along, saves the vet, and the other guy goes to hell. 
What? What? Why was the rich man in hell? By the way, the um, rich man Lazarus, because under the law of Moses, he was required to give assistance to Lazarus. That's why he was laid at the man's gate, because they knew the law required him to give assistance, because to his fellow citizen of Israel, fellow member of the covenant, he didn't. And he had he had more than he needed, abundantly more than he needed. See, there wasn't a problem. That he, wouldn't have, he could have given them the, the scraps off the table. He was partying daily. He could have just given them the leftovers. But he obviously didn't even want to see them there. Just like the, the cities, the homeless, for example. Um, now they're all over the place. But uh, cities don't want homeless shelters downtown because they, they want the homeless out of sight because it's bad for business. They want them out of sight someplace. <sighs> Not good. Not good. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life, eternal life. He that does not believe, in other words, that he has heard the gospel and rejected it. It's not that he that is ignorant, it's that he that is, does not believe. The one that does not believe the gospel. The Son, who does not believe the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's a scary thought. Where does the wrath of God abide on you? In hell. How long does it abide on you? As long as God abides. Well, as long as God abides. You think God's going to repent? Don't think so. It doesn't say the wrath of God abides on him for a while. It says the wrath of God abides on him, period. As the writer of Hebrews says, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, having rejected Christ. Terrifying. Francis wants to believe, tells us, uh, I think it's annihilationism. God will just annihilate those souls. Does the scripture teach that? No. Francis teaches whatever he wants. Haven't you noticed? So why do you listen to that guy? All right. I know why. All right. So let's get back to the, how do you tell genuine Christianity from a phony? Compare. Compare the differences. Like if I look at Roman Catholicism, there's a lot of things that are the same. There's a lot of things in this book, or this book, which is an older version that doesn't quite agree with this one. Now, if you were to compare this one with this one, <laughs> the Catechism of John Paul II with the Catechism of uh, Pope St. Saint, Pope Saint Pius V, uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, Trent, you would find some differences. This one guy has an awful lot of anathemas in it. Canons. He, if you say such and such, uh, anathema. Oh, an awful lot of those. <clears throat> Which uh, they actually anathematize Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul and everybody in the New Testament and everybody that's not Roman Catholic and what else? Everybody that doesn't agree with them. You're, you're damned to hell according to them. So apparently Jesus and the apostles are going to be in hell. They had not anathematized the, the, the gospel. As I read there in John 3, 36, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, he that believes in me has eternal life. John 3, 16 says the same thing. It's just uh, the, uh, the subjunctive, the, the, the should rather than shall. That's just an artifact of the grammar. It doesn't tell you about the certainty at all in that thing. But here it says it's indicative in 36. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's the gospel. Does it say he that believes and is baptized? No. Does it say he that believes and does good works? No. What does it say? He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. That's the gospel. In its simplest form. 
Now think of what Peter said. Peter asked, who do you say that I am? What did, what did Peter answer? Jesus said, who asked the question to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. For, heaven, for flesh and um, blood haven't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Same thing happened to me. God revealed to me that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he died for my sins. Did I see God? No, but suddenly I was... kneeling at my bunk. I, I remember I come to the point I gave up trying to be saved. I said, God, if you don't save me, I'm not going to be saved. I think that's about the time he did it, too. When you give up on your own ability and your own ideas and human ideas and you surrender yourself into his hands, call upon him. If you don't save me, I won't be saved. He saved me. The Spirit of God came into that room and I knew that Jesus died for my sins, all of them, past, present, and future. I knew because of what he did on the cross, I was right with God. I was justified. I was justified because of that. As Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's the gospel. Anytime somebody adds to that, they're changing it. So there's an entire section in uh, the Council of Trent, an uh, entire list of 15 canons on penance. And there's, what, 33, I think, on the subject of justification. These are all anathemas, all anathemas. Oh, and how many? There's a uh, marriage and everything. There are so many things that you have to believe or at least not say contrary in Roman Catholicism and, of course, the ones they invented in the 20th century, which were what? The Immaculate Conception of Mary. Or was that the 19th? And the 20th, I think, was her bodily assumption. Does the Bible say anything about either of those? No. That's not a part of the faith that's delivered once for all in the saints. Does does John here in chapter 3, or Jesus in chapter 3, say, if you believe in me and believe that my mother was immaculately conceived, you have eternal life. No. Does it say, if you don't believe my mother was immaculately conceived, you're going to hell? Does it say that? No. So you look at the differences between historic Roman Catholicism of the 16th century. This was the answer, by the way, to the Reformation. A bad answer. They had a choice. The church had a choice. They could either consider what the Reformers were saying and gone back to the Scripture and said, mm, yeah, perhaps we were wrong. Because at that point, Things weren't nailed down quite so tight. Uh, and you could, they could say, yes, popes and councils can make mistakes. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. They went the other way. They doubled down. They tripled down. They quadrupled down and anathematized the gospel itself. They anathematized being saved by faith alone in Christ. That was not sufficient. They said, anybody that says that, anathema. Said that we're, we're saved by that without works, anathema. Well, you anathematize Jesus. You anathematize the Apostle Paul, the, the Apostle John, the Apostle Peter. All the ones that say something contrary. They're all anathematized. Arrogant, godless children of Satan. That was the Council of Trent. And they have no reverse gear. This is one of the problems with Rome. When they had got that doctrine that uh, we have the keys of Peter, 
The problem is they can't figure out how to loose what they to they, they bind and but they don't have the loose side except loosing like commandments against strange affections. They have no way to apparently they have no reverse gear. They can't back up and say we made a mistake. Which means Roman Catholicism must necessarily get worse and worse and worse and worse. Because they can't go back and say, well, the Bible says this, we made a mistake. They just cannot do it. How can an infallible pope make a mistake? Of course, Vatican I declared all of the popes infallible. How can they do that? How can they say that, well, the councils made a mistake, even though there's councils that contradict the councils? One council says uh, Im worshiping images is wrong, and the next council comes along and says, no. And the one that says that you're not supposed to worship images is anathema. Huh. See, if you simply can admit that tradition is doesn't have the authority of Scripture and that we can make mistakes, then you can go back and fix it. Then you can talk, then people can talk to you. You can, you can have, a, but it's like uh, with Roman Catholicism. Okay, a number of years ago, uh, there was a group of Lutherans, part of the World Lutheran Apostate Federation, because no self-respecting Lutheran had anything to do with that, got together with Roman Catholics and came up with a document about agreement on the doctrines of justification, agreement that, that we're, we're justified by faith alone, sort of. The language is really slippery. Of course, it was really slippery because they weren't interested in the truth. Neither side was interested in the truth. They were interested in creating a synthetic agreement. That's it. But it didn't matter because, I mean, the Lutherans are wasting their time because you can talk to a bishop, you can talk to priests, you can talk to theologians, but and you can have an agreement with them, but that's not the same as getting the Roman Catholic Church to agree with it, is it? So it's just a, a document out there that means nothing because it has no authority behind it. They didn't have any authority. They were just having a dialogue. Dialogues have no authority. Uh, yeah, and the Lutherans are just wasting their time. So they think, oh, we can get them. So, so what? So you and some Catholics came up with a slippery document that says whatever each side wants it to say. So what? What does that accomplish? What you're doing is just trying to paper over the Reformation because the Lutherans didn't like it either. These are apostate. <laughs> the Lutherans just wanted to do what they wanted to do, too. So they wanted, well, let's just piper this thing over, which is what happens all the time in the Roman Catholic Church. So you have, okay, this is represents, this is the catechism of the Council of Trent. Okay, so Vatican I comes along, affirms the um, in, infallibility of the Pope. Vatican II comes along and affirms and affirmed Trent. Vatican II comes along, affirms Vatican I, and affirms Trent. And then they do that to it. So I got to have it on the screen, don't I? So here's Trent, and here's Vatican II. This is John Paul's the second catechism, which is out of date because. Francis has changed things like the Lord's Prayer <laughs> and capital punishment. Infallible doctrine, unchangeable doctrine, Francis just changed it. Not to, to mention the fact that certain sins are, are now to be blessed. Oh, we don't bless the sin. We just bless the relationship. Yeah, you bless the sinner. Where does sin come from? It's just free floating out there, or it is the fruit of sinners. So if you bless sinners that are practicing these sins, you're blessing the sin. You're blessing the sin. There's no it's where does sin come from? It's not an abstract thing. It doesn't exist by itself. It's what people do. What creatures do. They make the make it sound like these things are you know well you can we we can uh, love the sinner and hate the sin. 
but the sinner is what does the sin. That's where it comes from. If you hate the sin, how can you hate that separately from the, the, the source? <laughs> this is nonsense. It's nonsense. You cannot bless sin. You cannot bless the source of sin. You can call sinners to repentance, call sinners to faith in Christ. He is the atonement for their sin, and he will sanctify them and separate them from their sin. But outside of that, that that's the blessing. Salvation is the only acceptable blessing for any of us. No, Francis doesn't like that. Nor does he believe in a God that would send people to hell. And, and he exalts himself, like all Antichrists do, above the word of God itself. He says, well, I don't, I don't like the Lord's Prayer. I don't like the very words of Jesus. Now, let me tell you, there is no textual variant. There is no justification at all for what Francis did. You can't go back and say, well, some manuscripts say this and that. No, there isn't. There are no variants there. So when Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, and pray that, and Francis says, I don't like that. He is setting himself above God himself. Just like when he talks about blessing, unions in which the union exists for the purpose of committing certain sins. These are not platonic relationships, if there is such a thing. Once upon a time, when I was young or before, sometimes, especially younger people, you'd have a two, three uh, young women living together or, or a couple of young men living together in an apartment to share the costs. And you didn't think anything of it, <laughs> normally, unless it went on for 30 years. Uh, now... You know, you could have friends. I, I live with some friends. But uh, not so much today. That's not, kind of, that's not what they're talking about anyway. Same-sex couples, not same-sex friends that just happen to be living in the same place. They don't have that relationship with each other. You're talking about a particular kind of relationship and blessing them in that relationship. That is an act of Antichrist. That is an abomination, abomination that makes desolate. And Francis is full of them, just like bringing the Pachamamas into St. Peter's and blessing that and having... And, and having them in procession as all the cardinals and the bishops and the pope was there. And then they all went in procession out of St. Peter's, away from Christ. Leaving the altar of Christ going out into the world. Yeah, that's, that's what Francis is. He's a pied piper that leads you from Christ into damnation, into the world. Can't you see? Why has the Catholic Church historically not wanted Christians to read the Bible? In fact, there's a time to actually own a copy of the Bible, especially in your own language, with the death penalty. Uh, it wasn't until res relatively late, uh, recently that Catholics were uh, to read the Bible at all. And even then, you're not supposed to read it contrary to the teaching of the church. Generally, they prefer under supervision. And Catholic Bibles always have lots of notes to make sure you don't understand the Bible for what it actually says. 
Why is that? Because if you know what the Bible says, it raises questions in your mind. How come the church says something different? How come they're teaching what God forbids? How come they they forbid what God says is good? How do they do that? See, if when you compare it to the standard and you look at the differences, see, it, it, if Catholics know what the Bible says, they'll begin to see differences between what the apostles taught and what the church has taught. And that's one of the reasons why the introduction of the Greek New Testament at the time of the Reformation, at the beginning of the Reformation, Erasmus, who was not a reformer, the, it, it, that led in many ways to the Reformation because it was not a Latin translation. It was the original language. And people saw things in that, say, wait a minute, this is not what the church teaches. And that raised a bunch of questions and it triggered the Reformation. It was not Luther's 95 Theses. Not really, because who cares? That has nothing. See, Erasmus is going back to the original Greek. That was the power. The word of God, uncorrupted by translation, was the power to reveal. It, it uncovered the gospel, as was originally said, originally written down by the apostles. And people could read it and say, wait, this is not what the church is saying today. It's like the, the, the Pope. Where's the Pope in the Bible? Not there. Not there. Where is the, uh, the keys of the kingdom being passed on in the Bible? It's not there. It wasn't in the first centuries either. If you go back and look at the early church fathers and you search for these things, they're not there. When, uh, when Jesus said, Thou art uh, Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, did the early church fathers understand that to be Peter? Nope, they did not. They did not. None of them did. They understood that to be Christ himself. He is the rock. What did Peter confess? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who is the cornerstone of the church? Jesus. He's the foundation. But if you don't want to know the truth, well, uh, you have to receive the love of the truth from God in order to be saved. If you don't care about the truth, well, you don't care about the truth. You don't care about Jesus Christ because he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one that can save us. So any religion that comes along and, and has something else other than him says you have to have to do something other than believe in Jesus Christ. That's a different gospel. Any, any church that comes along and says, well, all the grace of Jesus Christ has been given to the church, and we dispense it through the sacraments, and that's the gospel. The church is the gospel. The sacraments are the gospel. Obeying the church is the gospel. That's a false gospel. It's not just Roman Catholics that do that, the Roman Catholic institution. See, they have, they've usurped the position of Christ. Rather than believing in him, it is believing in the church, trusting the church, obeying the church. That will never save you. You have to believe in Christ. Only by believing in him, personally, can you have everlasting life? He that believes in me has everlasting life. That's what the gospel is. The naked gospel without additions. That is sufficient to save you. Trusting in Christ. Don't accept substitutes. Don't accept any additions, because additions cut you off. As the apostle says in his epistle to uh, Galatians, because some teachers were going around adding a single commandment, the commandment to be circumcised, 
which actually goes back to Abraham. Not just to Moses, but to Abraham. And the Apostle Paul said, if you do that, if you think that you must believe in Jesus Christ and be circumcised, you have cut yourself off from Christ. He will be of no benefit to you because you're not trusting in him alone. You're trusting in him plus your obedience to the law of circumcision. How many laws do you have to keep as Roman Catholic? At least seven, or 17, excuse me. The Ten Commandments plus the seven laws of the church. What else must you do? All kinds of things. All kinds of th laws you must keep and things you must do. That's a different gospel. Jesus says, he that believes in me has everlasting life. You can believe Jesus. You think he would tell us the real gospel? I think so. He died for our sins. Pope Francis didn't. The Council of Trent didn't. Augustine didn't. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. None of those guys have risen from the dead. We should trust in him. We should examine all claims by God's standard, by what Jesus has said the gospel is, by what the apostles say the gospel is. We're saved through faith in Christ, period. Anybody that adds something to it, obedience, some other work, some other thing to do, they are teaching a different gospel. Paul says those people are to be anathematized, delivered over to God. Deliver them over to God. For God to deal with them. Because they are corrupting the gospel of God's love. They're corrupting the message of God's Son. They are shutting the door of heaven to, in people's faces. Christ came to open the way to heaven. They are shutting the door by adding their own conditions. That's a false gospel that will not save you. Faith in Christ alone, real faith, trusting faith, not just intellectual belief, not just assent, but trust is saving faith. And that alone can save you. Don't mix it with anything else, except no substitutes.